there's a whole bunch of people just piling in right now, guys. So I'm just going to wait an extra few seconds to make sure that everyone can log in, see me. Uh, I'll do a quick explanation on uh, on Waitroom, how it works is if you want to chat and ask questions, you just you hit the join the queue button. If you want to watch, just keep watching the way you are right now. Um, everyone who goes up gets a two minute window to ask whatever questions you want to ask. I'm happy to do a, you know, have a pretty frank conversation about most things. Um, not going to discuss uh, anything related to token prices, etc. So don't even ask those questions, please. But um, definitely want to talk about um, the, uh, the infrastructure we're building and the announcements today. So um, really looking forward to those those related questions. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, I'm going to hit the start. The, I'm actually going to. I'll start with the, with the preamble, and then we can go and start the queue in a few minutes. But uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm uh, I'm Vinny Lingham. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Civic. Um, it's a blockchain-based identity platform and protocol that we've been building for a number of years. Um, you know, to to give you some background on what Civic's been doing over the years, we started off building identity on Bitcoin. Uh, in 2017, we, we had the scaling wars and issues around the fees and scalability of Bitcoin. We, we then moved to Ethereum to build out the smart contracting for the identity.com marketplace. Um, and you know, today we announced uh, that we're moving over to Solana. So it's been a journey of, of chains uh, trying to find a solution that helps us scale identity globally. And so we're excited to talk about that today and, and how we got to Solana. And uh, um, you know, Anatoly from Solana will be joining me in about 20 odd minutes. Um, so uh, we'll definitely be excited to have him with us. Um, just the platform you guys are using, it's the Waitroom platform. Uh, I'm an investor in the company and, uh, you know, I'm just excited to what these guys have built, um, really using um, some pretty cool scheduling and, 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 and queuing features. So the idea is just you, know, you get AMAs that are live video. Um, and people get a pre-allocated amount of time to ask a question, which is great. So it's, it's kind of fair versus having someone speak for differing amounts of time, and some people can ramble. So I'll, I'll try and I'll try and make sure I get to as many questions as possible, and so we can have a live AMA. This this is uh, pretty exciting. I think it's probably one of the biggest rooms I've hosted to date. Um, it's very much better. So if you're having some problems, just email support at waitroom.com. But um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I think it's it's working pretty well. Um, you know, the purpose of this update is, is basically share a, a general update of, of Civic, where we're going, what we're thinking, what we're doing, um, and, and just interact with people in the community who are interested in, in decentralized identity and, and how it fits into the world and Web 3.0 uh, as it's evolving. Um, so I'm going to do the update for, a few, for the next few minutes and then I'll take questions and then we'll get to Anatoly. Um, so, the announcement today was that we are moving to Solana, and the key reasons for this is actually, you know, like obviously costs are important, and, and Ethereum fees have, you know, I've been sort of vocal this on, on, on Twitter. It's, it's been difficult for companies building um, use cases other than DeFi right now. I guess even DeFi is getting expensive for the mass market. Uh, NFTs, I suppose, when you're selling a sixty million dollar. Um, Item, you know, some gas fees don't really hurt you much, but just in general, when you're doing attestations on a blockchain and you're trying to build a blockchain, you can't have the you can't have a slow blockchain and you cannot have high fees, which is what we're struggling with on Ethereum right now. So we went through a process to look at all the um, uh, all the different you know, layer one solutions out there and layer two to some extent, um, and we narrowed it down to Solana. Now uh, I've known the Solana team since the beginning. I've uh, you know I I, I worked with them in the early days when they were trying to raise funding and brought them to Multicoin. And I think that the, what they've been building and executed on the past couple of years is has been pretty uh, impressive, uh, to say the least. And we think that for the identity use case, building out DID infrastructure on Solana is actually a really good, and I guess it's a bold move for us, but we realized that we cannot stay on Ethereum any longer. And uh, when we looked at the solutions, we felt Solana was the best suited for our use case, as well as just scale and cost in general and speed. Um, Solana's throughput and speed is just unparalleled uh, today. And so we're, we're excited to make the move and we're um, we're very happy that we, ha we, we have. And I, th I think once we made the decision and started looking deeper into it, it just becomes more and more obvious that we should have done this probably a long time ago. Um, 
instead of struggling on Ethereum. Um, you know, our, our kind of sister foundation, identity.com, has also made the move over. So it actually gives us a lot of, um, you know, I guess composability in some sense where the infrastructure that we're running identity on will be compatible with um, identity.com and, and, and Civic and we can, we can contribute to the code base on both sides. So everyone is really happy to be running on Solana, I think at this point. And so, um, you know, unfortunately we, we've had to make some tough decisions and we decided to, to sunset the health key product uh, for many reasons. I think uh, as we dug deeper into the, the industry, we saw a lot of the big players um, are getting into that, governments are getting into it. It's, been, it's going to become very politicized. We tried getting data, health data, securely, privately, and we just we're just not comfortable that we can we can um, live up to the ethos of the company in terms of privacy, uh, preserving uh, data gathering, and building a, a health wallet that makes sense uh, for people and to store all your health records on. And the health industry is very very complicated. So um, you know, I think at the end of the day, we just decided that we're going to step back from this and let the, the bigger guys play out. And if you want to trust them with their health records, then you're free to. But we don't think it lives up to what we want to do as a company, decentralizing identity as well as healthcare. And so we made the tough decision to, to sunset that product. But we're very excited about um, what we do with Solana, the integration. And we're very excited about um, Civic.Finance, which really is an evolution of our current wallet product in the sense that um, we were previously supporting Ethereum. And, and just to be frank, the gas fees to create an Ethereum wallet for us right now are like $500 per user. It, it's just not, it's not something, we better disable it. So even if you download so that you can get a Bitcoin wallet, we can't give you an Ethereum wallet, which is kind of sad. Um, but we're going to be making that wallet a Solana wallet and we'll be able to support, support SPL tokens. Uh, we'll be able to do a lot more with, um, with that wallet and and uh, running on Solana. So that's the exciting part about it. We also think that Solana becomes, um, you know, more of a gateway. Well, uh, sorry, Civic Finance becomes a gateway into the Solana universe. We think that um, it plays out very interestingly as you, you look at the, the costs and the fees. Um, you know, my views on Ethereum, I guess, play into this because I think Ethereum is a great test bed and it's a global sort of network that you can experiment with things like NFTs, DeFi, but ultimately, you know, if it can't scale and it's not cost effective for anyone but whales, uh, you know, people need to use it elsewhere. So I think that there'll be a number of companies like us joining the Solana ecosystem to build out things like DeFi, NFTs, etc. And maybe it's just a different market. Maybe it's, um, you, know, it, you know, Ethereum may just own the NFT market. We don't know how that plays out, but we think that for what we're trying to do with decentralized IDs, we can't play in the Ethereum ecosystem with the current fees. So we have to make the move. And Civic's never been one of those companies and, and projects that, you know, uh, are the, the last movers. We always tend to be the first movers on things and we try and get in early. And I think this is one of those examples where we're one of the first companies to publicly move from Ethereum to uh, a different chain like this. And uh, we're making, and it's, it's years of infrastructure that has support across. So uh, appreciate that with the resource constraints, we were basically just doubling down in Solana and saying, we're going to sunset health key and just double down and build out a good infrastructure on Solana. And we think that it can help the scale. So I'm going to take Q and a, we have a whole bunch of people in here and let's, let's see how it goes and um, excited to engage with the community in live video. So I'll start with you. Can you hear me? Hey, how's it going, man? Nice to meet you. Hi, th Hi man. Thanks. And nice to meet you too. Hi, I'm Kivo from Holland. Yes. And um, I liked your project a lot, and I really hope it goes really well. Um, I just have a, a question about the GDPR. Uh, that's very important in, um, in Europe and, of course, in Holland. Um, in Holland, they're already starting something. In the, they're in the early phases of a corona passport, and that goes really well into the uh, digital identity. Um, can you tell me a bit of your European goals? So GDPR compliance has been something which has been very close to what we design around as a company and as a project. So the the the, the architecture of civic technologies and identity.com is really that we don't store data. We allow you to store your own data and we allow you nice. to pull your data yes. privately and securely into your own digital wallet. And so what what, what this really means is that when it, when it comes to data privacy regulations, we actually, because we don't hold data, we don't have to do, there's nothing we have to do. We're giving you your data. 
And what the health mm -hmm. key part, part of the problems are, because of the number of intermediaries that have the data, and when you get it, and when you give it to someone, um, it's it, it's a bit of a problem for them to, to ensure compliance with GDPR and some of the other things. So I think what we're going to see is a number of health passports emerge from different countries, different companies, etc., mm -hmm. and they'll find out some level of oper operability. But I think people have to be uh, accept the fact that you know there may be data privacy uh, issues with that, and that's just the way it is right now. And, and we, that's why we're, we're going to sunset that product. Okay, man. Good luck. Thanks. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good to see you. Color. There we go. Hi, Vinny. How's it going? Hey, nice to meet you. Can you hear me well? Cool. Yeah, I can hear you. Nice to meet you as well. Great. So I, I was curious, uh, Vinny, um, have you guys uh, utilized or have have uh, attempted to uh, contemplate utilization of your identification uh, capabilities in terms of um, like authenticating a caller? So like, for example, like our organization, um, we work in the FinTech industry, you know, we have just over 6,000 FTEs and we do a lot of outbound calls to do like fraud investigations, et cetera. And, you know, we spend upwards times of like two or three minutes just authenticating that it is the customer who we're talking to on the other line. Yeah. So just you know, time and cost savings, if they just, you know, were able to tap, you know, your app and identify themselves, we would, we would shave off a lot, right? So I was wondering, have you guys seen that type of workflow with any, you know, existing solutions with partners you guys may have? Yeah, so th this is possible to do. I mean, this would this would be a custom type of integration. If we had, okay. if you had thousands of employees or whatever it is, and you want to do it with us, uh, we'd give you an SDK that you could put into your, you know, your corporate app in your phone, and maybe just have somebody do a push notification to authenticate when they call in. Um, but uh, it is it is possible. It's not, I would say, a core mainstream use case for us right now. But again, you know, if companies want to do this sort of thing, we, we you know we do have the, the, obviously the infrastructure to do it. It's just not something we've. I like. Uh, I know banks use like text messaging, so that you know they'll send you a text while yeah. you're on the phone, call and, and so that's that can be done by push notification as well. Um, the use cases for, for for identity is really endless, and it's really about finding ones that we think really lead to some sort of breakout usage of decentralized um, identification. Um, and it, it's hard for a small group to do that. Understood. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you, Christian. Thanks for joining. Okay. Evan, uh, it's Evan. Evan, hey, nice to meet you. Hey, Vinny, how are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. Great, fantastic. Uh, so my name is Evan Huddleston. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Happy Hour. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to talk with your team a little bit about what we're building. Uh, it's a marketing platform for bars and restaurants on a global scale. And we think that one of the biggest problems that we're going to be facing is why does someone have to show all of their personal identification information to someone to simply get a drink? Um, we think that your platform and your technology is going to be pivotal to us growing at scale globally. Um, but the problem for us as a startup right now, um, you know, we're applying to Y Combinator, we're looking to get funding before the end of the year. But um, at, at current pace, um, you know, uh, a quarter per verification becomes really expensive for us if we start scaling into thousands, tens of thousands of users. Um, with this move to Solana, um, do you um, view the fees uh, to be going down for the verification processes that you have listed currently, um, or maybe like a different sort of API or SDK setup that would make this more affordable for technical founders like myself? So are you looking at uh, survey.com forward slash pricing? That, yes. Uh, page? Yeah. So, so we just announced that today. I, I can say that at scale that th those prices do come down uh, quite significantly. Um, you know, if you look at the number of transactions, we're looking at, you know, two and a half thousand to 30,000 monthly active users um, at scale. But like, it's one of those things where I think even small technical founders like yourself, and you know, if you guys w wanted some sort of, um, you know, we, we can figure out something to give you guys some sort of buffer uh, on the pricing, at least while you're ramping up. We do know that it, it does get a little pricey. Uh, on the, it, it, one of the problems, so one of the things that we have to deal with is the network effect. The bigger the network, uh, and I'm, I'll, I'm, you're gonna go, I'm gonna hold the queue so I can finish this point before the next person joins. Um, but uh, thanks, thanks for your question, Aaron. So one of, the, one of the things about dropping the cost of verification is it's about the network effect. So the more people we have in the network, the cheaper it gets. And the reason is the way we do the cost structure is even though we're charging 25 cents, for example, um, the cost to verify someone is north of 
you know, two or three or four bucks just from driver's license scanning, uh, uh, facial recognition, the tech that goes into all that. So then, you know, the fact that you're paying a fraction of what it costs means that we have to eat the cost of, the, let's, say, let's just say it's 250, right? We have to eat the cost of the 250, but every time that person uses the, the device, uh, we get 25 cents back. So we have to get them to use it 10 times to break even in theory. Now, if the network got really big and people use the, the app 50 times or 100 times a year, we can bring down the average cost per transaction. But we still have to make, obviously recoup the cost of verification because there are hard costs that we have to pay to our vendors to, you know, for example, biometric or, or document checking, et cetera. And so th that's the real issue. Uh, I still think that Civic is going to be and is the cheapest product in the market right now with our new pricing that we've announced, so Civic.com for just pricing. Um, and if you look at those pricing, I don't think you'll get it anywhere else because we are we have built reusable identification. And so anyone who's not using reusable, you're paying the full cost of a, a one-time use. And that's how we're bringing price down. So we're, we're very excited that this opens up new markets for people. Uh, and and you know, we've done vending machines in the past. We've announced that stuff. And we've got vending machine partners out there working on this. Vending machine is a good example. Where they're happy to charge 25 cents for a beer, which costs 450 or 5 bucks. Because if they do a full verification, that would cost 250 and a beer is you know, 5 bucks. So uh, you know, we think the reusable nature of identity is what's important here. Becca, Hi, hey. how's it going? How's it going? Yeah. Hey guys, uh, full disclosure, I'm from Civic. I'm just hopping in the queue because it was a little low on people. So I want to encourage all of you 163 viewers to get on here and um, ask me some questions before Anatoly hops on in about 10 minutes or so. Um, but, uh, oh, and one other thing, if you're having connectivity issues, lower left-hand corner of your web browser, um, you can click on the gear wheel and lower the quality of your camera. Um, so that should help with some of the connectivity issues. But so, Vinny, since I have you on, I was hoping to ask you to just kind of expand a little bit on the timing of this announcement. Why is it important to make this move now? Um, we're, we're making a, a big blockchain move. Um, we're early in doing this. And um, I think you've talked a little bit about being a first mover, getting in there first. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So th thanks, Becca. Like, I, I think if if um, if we look at how DeFi has exploded and even our NFTs are taking off, and we make the assumption that people have to um, you know find other places to to run these projects and and and, and take these use cases off off Ethereum because of the cost, where are they going to go? So we think Ethereum is uh, we think Solana is one of the places that it makes the most sense to go to just because of the cost and the speed, especially. And then uh, we think that like the, the Sony ecosystem is growing rapidly and there's need for identity infrastructure there um, as well. And so I think just being early in a fast growing ecosystem is, a, is a, just a really good accelerant for what we're doing. And we need, we need to accelerate DIDs, decentralized identities into the world. And we think this is the best way to do it. So, it, you know, yes, we're early, but I think the vectors are all there for this to be a successful um, move for us. And we, as I said, we can't stay on Ethereum. Uh, it's just not economically uh, you know, an option for us. Thanks, Becca. Carla, hey. Thanks, Vinny. I just had a follow-up question. Oh, I was wondering, and, and Becca kind of stole, uh, Becca kind of stole my thunder, but I was wondering, you know, what, uh, what kind of took so long to make this decision to move over to Solana? You know, uh, COVID hit last year and uh, obviously everyone knows that. <laughs> and, uh, I right. think midway through the year, we launched the Civic Wallet in, uh, it was June, July uh, timeframe. And when we designed the Civic Wallet initially, it was 25 cents of gas. By the time we took it down, it was $250 per user in gas. We're sitting at around 500, 500 bucks right now to execute the smart contracts. It's just like, you know, what took so long? Uh, it's about six months. We, we, you know, we were a little bit, a little bit of hopium for three months that things could resolve, and we were, you know, hopeful for ETH 2.0. And, and the more we just dug into it, the more we realized that just, you know, single threaded computation blockchain is not, not going to scale for our, our needs. And moving to Solana it was, you know, we took about three months to three or four months to evaluate the different options. We looked at pretty much all the top uh, uh, layer one solutions, and it was very clear that we had to move. And then Solana was the obvious choice for us uh, once we had done all the research. Got it. So you guys, uh, you guys are projecting kind of like a decrease in fees is going to lead to 
kind of more proliferation and use of the identification software? Because I imagine, right, because if you were charging those, if you had those gas fees, you probably passed it on to the client, so higher revenue, but it just wasn't, uh, you know, utilized as often because of the pricing, was that the issue? It's, it's hard to pass the pricing on to a consumer. Like, it's hard telling a consumer you should be paying yeah. the gas fees, but they, like, a lot of consumers don't even know what gas is. They just want to have, you know, a decentralized ID or a, a crypto wallet, and they're not used to paying gas fees for anything. Um, they want to just store their tokens. And so that's, it's just not, it's not palatable for us. Uh, we have to move, and, and obviously from the cost. Yeah. I'm excited to see the price. Yeah, thanks, Carlo. Great. Welcome back, Evan. Hey, I just wanted to say thank you so much for answering the question. I, I totally agree. You know, we understand 100% that scalability is the number one thing that's going to drive down the cost of, you know, doing verification. Um, right now, what do you see as being the biggest challenge to adoption for uh, either the wallet or um, the products that you're going to be offering for businesses like ours that are looking to digitize things like passports, um, photo IDs, driver's licenses? that kind of stuff. What other real world use cases or partners do you guys have right now that are helping you grow that base? So we're working with a number of partners. We've announced Johnson Controls. Um, Johnson Controls was a, was a great use case because that was basically building access control and we were piloting it with them in New York. So you're going to a building in New York, which obviously we were launching in March of 2020. <laughs> it's a really bad time to go into buildings in New York. So that didn't happen. But uh, you know, building access controls one, I think any any industry that we can create a network effect in, for example, if we can start powering identity for creators across marketplaces, NFT creators, uh, and verifying their identities regardless of which marketplace they're selling their art on, that, that's a huge opportunity for us. Um, but it goes on. So like your, your use case with bars, we'd love for every bar to be saying, hey, civic identity is a very valid year and verified year, and you, know, you can come into the bar and get a beer. Uh, vending machines, exactly. So same thing. So we look for network effect sort of market opportunities because that really enhances the, the cost savings for us because if the same person is using the identity multiple times digitally, uh, we can now you know, amortize that cost over more transactions. So that, that, that's the way we look at it is how do we how, how do we go and partner with companies that have ecosystems or how do we go into ecosystems where there's a number of companies that need the same service? Well, we'd love to partner with you. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me and doing the AMA. Sure. It's great to meet you. Thanks, Evan. And e just email partners at civic.com and we've got the whole team of people willing to reach out to you and help you out. Sounds great. And Becca's back filling the queue. Hi. I'm back. People. Any more questions yet? <laughs> yeah, we've got time for one or two more before we have our special guest. So, um, so Vinny, your next question, um, just wanted you to talk a little bit about the opportunity for Civic in the DeFi space. I know you've talked about the DeFi landscape in the past. Um, with this move, I think there's a, a pretty big opportunity and just wanted you to share a little bit more color. Yeah, so so the, the DeFi space is interesting. I think uh, we all, you know, we all see where this is going on, on Ethereum. It, we've spoken to a number of traders in the DeFi world, and the smaller guys are getting priced out. It's as simple as that. You, you can't do thousand dollar trades when you pay fifty bucks or hundred bucks in gas fees. Uh, and and so we think the opportunity on Solana to build out DeFi infrastructure. Hey, Anatoly, welcome. Thanks, Vinny. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you, man. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Let's uh, hope you've been getting some sleep lately. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you know, I, I see you have like a nice COVID beard too. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know how much money we've yeah. saved on bases this past year? It's insane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. Well, well, welcome, Anatoly. I've just been chatting to the uh, the civic community. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people in the Solana community as well, and uh, really excited about the news today. Uh, and as I as I've been saying, you know, we've We've done. We 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 did a, a whole like view of the ecosystem around layer one solutions, and we picked Solana in the end for, for many reasons. Cost is one, but I think speed and and speed of finality of transactions was a huge part of it, and how fast uh, Solana is. Um, but before we get into that, uh, just you know, want to want to maybe break the ice to the audience, like tell everyone about how we met. <laughs> um. I, uh, this was like right when I was raising seed funding and uh, before I had really any commitments from any like investors, I was, you know, in a thousand, you know, I was going one meeting after another looking for those first, for that first big check. Um, and we have, I have a common friend with Vinny who plays underwater hockey. So this is kind of like 
that this weird sport, that small community is really how I got my start. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was connected to Vinny and uh, he connected me to Kyle and Multicoin and they're really our first big champion uh, and got us over the hump and got us funding and have been really critical to our success for the last three years. Yeah, it's, it's been great. And, and I remember the day Antonio walked into my office and like, when I, so, so David is the guy who introduced us and I invested in his company before that. And he, he's like, but you know, you, you know, about, about this blockchain thing, can you, can you go <laughs> and, uh, this guy named Anatoly, you know, uh, Yakovenko. I'm like, dude, a, a Russian blockchain guy, imagine that. <laughs> so I was like, yep. he came in and he's like, okay, I got this like crazy idea. And, and I've been chatting to him totally for like 10 minutes. I'm like, actually, he's onto something. Because I was very skeptical at first. Uh, and, you know, I was very impressed with Anatoly's knowledge. And Anatoly yeah, was uh, ex Polcom as well. So he really got every, you know, he, he got a good sense of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the tech stack from basically like, you know, low level code all the way up to uh, building out a, a global, a global um, product. And, yeah. and he's done really well. So, so I've, been ex I've been excited about what, what they've been doing since the beginning. So I, was, um, I, I actually okay. thought that like, go ahead. I thought at the time that no, everybody would be kind of following, like building the exact same design, kind of like betting on hardware and trying to solve the problem the same way. There was actually like a proposal out of Intel called Poet, proof of elapsed time, they used SGX. <laughs> to me, it seemed like all the hardware people were thinking the exact same thing. But there are like you know only one team that actually went and went for it. <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing more powerful than an idea this time has come. So like I I, I was excited about it when I saw it and I you know we we had lots of lots of lots of lunches and dinners and sushi in San Francisco debating on where Solana is going to wind up and I don't think uh, Anatoly would have thought it'd be this far this quickly as well. So. Uh, but there's been lots of sleepless nights from what I from what I know about what's going on in the background. So you know, to be fair, like I, I've known Anatoly since the beginning of his journey, and I've just been super impressed on how they've executed, and I'm, I'm a supporter. And uh, you know, that said, I think the technical team at, at Civic did an independent review of things and looked at all the solutions out there, and they also came to the same conclusion that this was the best solution for us. So I'm excited about that. So, uh, Tony, tell me about. Uh, what has it been like for Solana since September? Because like Civic, we launched our Civic wallet in June, July-ish, and and the fees went nuts on, on ETH in September. So what has it been like for Solana as, as an alternative layer one solution? Um, I think kind of like the you know I, I kind of see two 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 things happening. One is that like there's a bunch of entrenched projects in ETH. Uh, with users that are ETH denominated and they make more money when prices go up because even though gas fees go up, volumes go up, prices of all the assets that the trade go up and they don't really care. They don't, they don't care that, you know, that gas costs 300 bucks when they're making $10,000 on that trade. Um, and this is almost like the, the ETH success is its own kind of like detriment right now. Because I think it's obvious to everybody that there's product market fit for these ideas, and these ideas can be scaled to a very large consumer base, but there's no way to do this on Ethereum. Um, and what's been kind of, you know, like, I guess this is our advantage that we actually have, you know, the ability to scale to a very large user base. So folks that have vision outside of, I need to make money trading in Uniswap with other folks that hold ETH, um, those products that are looking for, general market product market fit um we've been able to you know talk to all of them right like we we effectively like i think the the market is fully open to onboard those folks to a layer one like us and to help them reach a million people or 10 million people um audius is like one of my favorite examples because they're chain agnostic you know they they have a token on ethereum they have parts of it on poa uh parts of the those parts that are in POA are migrating to Solana, and plus new features are being added that are completely consumer facing. None of the stuff is anything that like is even remotely on the roadmap in Ethereum, but if that application wants to stay decentralized and wants to build these like richer environments, um, 
like we're the place to do it. And this is what like my vision for blockchain was that if it's fast enough, right? Like if we can actually make this thing fast enough to scale to 10 million people, a hundred million people, then like all the stuff that we see that's, you know, kind of like the negative effects of big tech that's poisoning big, like kind of our environment, we can remove all of that and do it in a trustless decentralized way. So I'm, I'm really excited about the next five years. Uh, that's great, Tony. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, why, why do you think Solana is the right platform for DeFi? I mean, I, you, you've touched on it before, um, but the, the, key, the key aspects of it, like what do you think makes it better for DeFi than Ethereum? Obviously, you know, fees aside. Gee, this cheesy slide deck that said that Solana is blockchain and NASDAQ speed. Uh, and this was because what I envisioned was that if you have this like universal supercomputer, right, that's distributed around the world, it's by definition a price discovery engine. Like as like an engineer, you can kind of mechanically and visualize that there's a bunch of memory. That memory is just arbitrary bits. And if I can send a cryptographically signed message that extracts money out of those bits, I'm gonna go search this like space, right? Search the solution space for free money and go do that. And that is effectively arbitrage. This is what market makers, what uh, hedge funds do when they observe information around the world. They figure out all the prices between all the assets, calculate the risk engine, and then try to ex extract free money from trading, right? So if this, if arbitrage is possible in the system, then it's by definition kind of a very fancy price discovery engine. It's programmable. You can write all these crazy new like style financial products and plug them in and scale into millions of people, right? But by definition, this is what it does. So my my theory was that we can, because we have this kind of unique approach where we have this clock that's outside of consensus, we can in theory approach that that the speed of a state transition, like a message that propagates through Solana is gonna move as fast as news through news through fiber. Speed of light through fiber is the speed of news. Some event happens in Hong Kong, that information travels to a Bloomberg terminal, that trader should see that price already reflected at the New York Stock Exchange or in a market running in Solana. And if we can achieve that kind of parity, that means that we can re be competitive at New York Stock Exchange and all the important trades, like an actual newsworthy price moving like information trades, we can compete with them. So this was what I was thinking of, like price discovery. It wasn't even called DeFi at the time. <laughs> uh, but that's basically like, you know, like we got really lucky with the folks that introduced us to Serum, which was, you know, Multicoin and like uh, Edith and, and, and Chris McCann from like 500 startups. They, they like helped us get in touch with FTX and Sam. And he is uh, kind of like, a visionary that looks well much bigger than the ethereum he, his vision is much bigger than ethereum and he kind of had the same idea that like if these systems are fast enough if that's possible maybe not 50 percent of the world's finance can run on it but maybe 25 and that's a big enough uh you know that's a big enough vision like market that it's worth like doing something interesting so they never really wanted to build like a like a you know Uniswap knockoff, right? They want, they wanted to do something that was impossible in Ethereum, and they were looking for a blockchain that could do this. And we were the only ones that actually were live and could demonstrate that performance and had you know the roadmap to scale it. Uh, and that roadmap is you know hardware is going to get twice as cheap in two years and twice as powerful, and Solana is going to get twice as cheap and twice as powerful because all we're doing is like horizontal scaling if we're trying to squeeze out every bit of silicon we can like uh, and get you know provide it to users no that's great it's, it's a fantastic uh, uh viewpoint on on how this plays out i, I like i i couldn't agree with you more i think one of the things the problems i've had with in the past with even bitcoin and ethereum is the 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 scale scalability of those systems in terms of tps i mean bitcoin seven i think ethereum's like 15 like you know, it's really great if you have whales doing large transactions and creating liquidity pools with 
But when the whales go away, what do you do then? And I've always been a, fa a fan of bottoms up liquidity, where if you look at how Robinhood and small traders actually provide so much liquidity to the market now in, in, in the finan traditional financial world, in, in, so in, in sort of centralized finance, in decentralized finance, we really need millions and of people transacting. And even if they're doing $5 or $10 or $50 trades, that you know, if you add up enough for those people, that's that's this that's more liquidity than what the whales can provide. And so markets are far more liquid when you have more broader participation, even at smaller amounts. And this is why cash is such a liquid market, right? How many cash transactions are there a day in the world? And they're all zero costs, right? Cash is a cash is a feeless transaction uh, globally. And so cash provides massive global liquidity, but but you know, obviously. It's not, it's very isolated to certain markets. Every country has its own sort of fiat currency. But the same principle should apply also. If you want liquidity, you want to have lots and lots of small transactions. And, and this is where Visa and MasterCard breaks down because they have really high fees on small transactions. So if you're doing, like most merchants won't accept the credit card for five or 10 bucks, the fees are too high. But cash is, you know, cash, cash fills that market pretty easily. So I, I agree with you. And I think if we, if we find that 25% of the global finance market became you know in DeFi, we know that Ethereum can't handle that. It's just not like the way it's designed right now, it can't maybe as a layer two, but not as a layer one. And there's like you and I, I think in the first conversation, we had this really great conversation about layer one versus layer two scaling. And uh, you know, I, I think layer two has its place. I just don't think it's for you know the, the sort of global computer uh, market that we're trying to build. Um, and so so let's touch a bit about uh, identity and you know we, we've always believed that identity is a cornerstone of, of blockchain technologies and decentralized identity anyway, it sh should be. How do you see identity and DIDs and, and the stuff we're doing fitting into the, the Solana ecosystem? Just trading. Um, I think like the kinds of marketplaces that uh, exist, like what's going to stop blockchain is like the entrenched members like New York Stock Exchange, CME, just constantly throwing mud at it that it's scammy, it's not like following regulation, et cetera, et cetera. Even, even if that's total BS, this is what's going to stop the adoption of, of these technologies. And if you have cryptographic identity where we're not leaking private, private information, but we're leaking like attestations that are like guarantee that I, I can trade with the other person in these markets. If we can do that, that means that there is really no modes for these entrenched players, right? Like there is really no reason why uh, somebody that is actually doing price discovery, that is doing all of this like massively complicated information gathering and computation to figure out that an asset like Tesla at this particular price point should have this much at risk, right? That, that's a hard problem if they can spin up markets that guarantee that they're compliant to whatever they're like, you know, compliant folks want, um, that means that there's no moats. And, and to me, this is kind of like in that, in that kind of primal use case that we're focusing on, which is, you know, blockchain at NASDAQ speed. I think that's, that could really rapidly change like the landscape in traditional trading. You know, this, this is where like, you know, you see like these, small baby steps and then things happen all of a sudden and like volumes shift dramatically from, you know, CME and your stock exchange to a decentralized platform, which has almost no fees. And the people that want to create those markets are able to do so with like, you know, the cost of a few bucks to spin up in you know, a smart contract. Um, that, that to me is like, like kind of one of those massive opportunities. Um, in the long term, I think like, what was super interesting to me was that like in DeFi summer, it wasn't so much that there were like a bunch of, you know, new discoveries in terms of like algorithmic stable coins, but there were really massive formations of people like rapidly forming around like an idea. It was almost like six degrees in the nineties. I don't know if you remember this, but like you would get like an email that said like, Hey, you're like three emails away from like somebody famous. I remember and that. it was, it was dumb right and like i didn't know that that was going to end up being facebook right like you kind of don't see the vision of that but i think right now what we saw in DeFi summer were like 10 20 000 people max forming around an idea well imagine scaling that to a million to 10 million and organizing those folks and then being able to prove like 
identities within those communities and then like rapidly mobilize and take action, right? Like we don't actually need to have voting for our representatives on blockchain. We just need to be able to organize and then have like guarantee that the people we're working with are actual humans like in the United States. And then we can all take action collectively. And, and this is like, I think, you know, five years from now, but you know, everything in crypto moves at like napalm speed, right? So who knows? <laughs> like, I feel like if you have a million people organized like on blockchain that can actually have like proofs about who they're talking to, I, I think that's massively transformative. I mean, those are those social networks are gonna blow away Facebook out of the water um, because yeah. they have no like, there's no reason for them to have advertisement, right? There's no reason for them to poison those communities. They're truly like collaborative, for community only kind of networks and the you know mutual aid networks is like another term for it so i'm i'm super excited about this like in the long term where these kinds of features are scaled to you know 100 million people yeah no that, that, that's great thanks Oli. um so what do you think about um you know commercial capital and corporate capital coming into a into to um uh, AMMs, right? Like, do you think that they're going to go into dark money pools or do you think identity and KYC plays into that? Um, uh, I think like, and like, this is like kind of <laughs> above my pay grade. I don't know enough about that space, <laughs> like to really understand how it works, but it yeah. seems like, <laughs> it, it seems like, uh, most most folks have like figured out jurisdictions where they can operate and have like, parts of their companies there, right? But that doesn't mean that like uh, more traditional or larger portions of capital can actually enter that, right? They, they're like ways to test like, do these markets work? Is there a, a way for us to make profit? Um, I think if you have like clear open marketplaces that are like regulatory compliant, like within the United States, then all the money that's sitting in the US can participate in those. You don't have to like move parts of it offshore. Um, so there, there's like a ton of friction, obviously, to like figure out how do I like, you know, split my company in two and have like separate teams working over there. Like, I think that friction is definitely preventing like bigger players from participating, um, well, like in, in these marketplaces. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you look at Tesla, for example, and MicroStrategy and a few others, they're buying all this crypto. How do they get a yield on it? Right. They're going to have to put it into an AMM somewhere. And, uh, and, and you know, like they're not going to go just dump it into, you know, it's some random unaudited smart contract or they don't know who the counterparty is or whatever risks they're, they're having to deal with. Um, so I guess like th that's really the thinking as, as crypto moves onto corporate balance sheets, um, corporates are going to look for places that they can, they can, you know, basically get yield uh, in the DeFi world. And that's why I think Solana is interesting, obviously, for the reasons we mentioned, because at that level of scale, uh, you, you know, th there's going to be a lot of smaller people looking to hey listen i'll you know i'll work on the on the other side of the equation and um because it's large amounts right like no who, who not many companies can be the counterparty for 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 1.5 billion dollars worth of bitcoin <laughs> or two yeah. whatever it's right yeah now. for sure yeah um, yeah um oh. i i think like to add to that i think like what's exciting right now is that you can have like small teams that can basically take these features like identity plus circle apis and create like the equivalent to what a bank provides but you know it's just two people and that build a fund that just talks to the apis and a couple smart contracts and like the coolest thing about DeFi is that if you have like these markets like ave lending protocols the folks that participate in that bank and earn yields that are much much larger than what you can out of bank of america right like <laughs> I mean, like you're gonna get 0.01 percent, <laughs> if, if, if anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Like when when I think like you can realistically get like eight eight to eight to twenty percent, like risk free in a, in a smart contract right now because the space is so like kind of thirsty for lenders. Like there's not enough capital to borrow, and this is why the yields are so high. Yeah, I totally agree. And and uh, but again, it goes back to the other problem is like I think part of the issue, part of the reason why these yields are so high is that only big players can participate right now with gas fees being so high. And and so this is why if people could put in a thousand bucks, I mean, imagine putting a thousand bucks in 
paying 50 bucks an ETH to earn 5%. Like the math doesn't make sense. And so this is the problem right now is that the fees are basically forcing these rates to be high because only whales can participate and mass capital can't come in. And that's what Solana changes because if we can move and build AMMs on top of Solana and even bring KYC and identity to some of them, like not all AMMs will have KYC or identity built into it, but I think it's more important that you get lots of small players participating and, and not just the whales to increase the liquidity pools. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so guys, you know, there's 141 of you out there. I'm sure 143 right now. Um, I'd love to see more questions coming for Anatoly. So join the queue. I'm going to resume quickly and see what uh, Mumtaz wants to ask if he's still there. Uh, but please join up and ask some questions. There you go. Uh, hey. Hello. Hey. hey, Vinny, how are you? I'm Montaz from Vancouver, Canada. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So Vinny, my question was regarding uh, the, since you did, uh, so now you're moving to Solana, but uh, don't you think like if you would wait to Ethereum layer two solution like that? So what if like uh, once the Ethereum layer two, like, the updates that they are doing by the end of this year are beginning next year next year that's what they are saying so then i mean it, the fees they are doing what they are doing the, with the layer 2 solution the fees will decrease and also it will be faster so what's then the point to move to solana so, so do you I'll, believe I'll, in I'll engineering a timeline that says it's going to be done in the yeah. year <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you give a more detailed answer there, but I, I want to start off by saying the one thing, one lesson people in the crypto community are going to have to learn is that markets don't wait for engineers to be ready. Okay, markets move and you have to adopt whatever technology is available at that time to go with the market. You can't wait for solutions which, which may or may not be on the timeline, but totally go ahead. Like rollups only solve like the execution problem, right, in terms of like how much, um, like physical compute that are, that are any block can take, but there's still limited space, right? So that limited space is not enough for a large number of users. Um, so you, you can solve some of those problems with zero knowledge rollups, uh, but even there you're dealing with like still large proving times and long aggregation times. Um, so if you're building like a consumer facing application that needs to wait 30, 90 seconds, right, for that user to know that their event is settled. Uh, that's a much worse use case than something like Solana where you get finality in like one to two seconds. Um, in fact, there's a couple teams building um, equivalent to optimistic rollups. Um, I think we'll probably end up calling them optimistic sidechains on Solana that execute EVM, the Ethereum VM as a smart contract in Solana. You know, timelines and those end of the year, right? Who knows? There's a bunch of big pile of stuff that needs to be done. But in that world that that works, uh, a, tr a transaction that's optimistically finalized on Solana and then eventually settled on Ethereum can be like, you know, if, imagine there's a, an AMM that's running in this environment. A trader can trade in that AMM in the same atomic transaction and take a position on Serum to hedge it. So it's actually state that settled on Solana first, uh, which is pretty cool. And that really pushes, you know, like Ethereum as like settlement layer, you know, and that that's great. Like settlement is one of those things that I think Ethereum is great at, but execution and like actual, like doing, doing price discovery and like doing that, you know, really fast response time to users. Uh, this is where we excel. And, you know, in two years, we're going to have twice as much hardware to do it. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, that, and look again to, to your point. Like, I, I don't think that the time. I think the timelines for ETH two are very optimistic. And secondly, even if they got the timelines right, I think the cost savings are also very optimistic. I don't think we're going to get Ethereum down to sub one cent or even single digit pennies per transaction anytime soon. Uh, and so that so that's going to be a concern, I think, um, for us. And we and and it's sort of we can't wait for end of the year. For maybe it's going to be scalable. Maybe it's going to be cheaper. Maybe it's going to be you know economically uh, optimal for us as a as an organization to operate on. We we can't wait. We got to go. We got to go right now. And that's one of the things lessons that you, we have to learn in tech is that like markets don't wait. Markets move on. And so 
as a company, we've had to move on. Evan, welcome back. <laughs> hey, hey, that, that, this one isn't for you, Vinny, I promise. I've already bothered you enough. Uh, Anatoly, thank you so much for, for making the time to come on. Um, we are considering uh, an ICO within the next 24 months for a coin that we would use that could basically be used when you go to scan a code that gives you a promotion. So our app, right, we allow businesses, uh, bars and restaurants to create promotions. Users find that on their device via a map. They go in, they get a QR code scanned, they get a deal. We don't do transactions or anything like that. And we're considering launching a coin to reward every single code that gets scanned for the individual scanning it, the business, and the individual at the business as a form of a tip. Um, is this something that you see as being scalable on Solana? Because we haven't gone forward with our plan with this because Ethereum is so expensive, as Vinny has mentioned. Yeah, but those kinds of transactions uh, are totally easy to support. Um, so like an application like Audius, what they're using Solana for is tracking like music plays. Like whenever somebody plays a song, there's like a transaction that hits the network. Um, so at that, like they have 3 million monthly active users, you know, so it's cheap enough for that. <laughs> like, uh, and the, like, I, you know, I would, you know, as Vinny recommend, as heavily like influenced me, build a product, get users, then launch the coin. <laughs> that That's like the best path. Like it's actually like go hustle for product market fit, like work as hard as you can to like iterate on that. And where tokens really accelerate things is when you're at that, like, I have 300 fans that like love this product, like one to 200, like one to 300 people that are already committed to, to using this thing and love it. And this is where like a token release, like a Uniswap accelerated them, right? To like have volumes greater than Coinbase because they waited, right? They actually had users that like love that product. So that, that was like kind of, advice that came from every VC in the space <laughs> and uh, a lot of folks in crypto didn't listen to but a lot of silicon valley folks always tell you get get product market fit first everything else is easy after that yeah the idea i think other advice i i said to you back in the early days in in the, in the bear market is you're never going to get this much time to make sure that the base layer infrastructure of your product is good so spend I remember this, I think it was Sushi at uh, Osumo or something, we were having this conversation around, look, optimize yeah. everything you can right now, because once this thing, once you go live, you're not gonna have time to refactor that code. And I think you did that, right? That was that was a big part of what you guys focused on. You know, even though other people would like trying to say, hey, go market yeah. this and get, you know. <laughs> Sorry, is there yeah, someone? We, we heavily focused on making sure it works and then making it as fast as possible. Um, and there's still like infinite infinite amount of work left. <laughs> yeah, no, so that, that that's great. It, it's been um, it's been it's been a good journey to watch how uh, you know how the thesis has played out around Solana, and, and I think it's you know Solana is easily one of the top three or five challenges to Ethereum right now, uh, and and you know different use cases will come up to different conclusions. For identity, we, we came to the conclusion that Solana was the best, but if you're doing a different type of project, you may think that you know one of the other layer ones is a better option, then that's fine. And that's that's the beauty of the market, right? The market will choose um, you know, based upon need and utility. So but we're excited and 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 Atoli, thank you so much for your time. We've got like a minute or two left. Um, I don't think there's any more questions coming through, but I really enjoyed having you on uh, on this 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 AMA. Uh we're, we're excited to be you know, in some ways merging the the, the civic sort of community and the Solana community in one to like, you know, really chair on the, the, the sort of collaboration between uh, our two platforms and what we can do together. And I think, I personally think this is the start of more companies moving from Ethereum to Solana and other layer ones because of the cost, which is kind of good for Ethereum in a sense, because it takes the heat of Ethereum and it actually makes it, it, Ethereum is a great test bed for new ideas and, 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 and new things. And so the real question is like, if you get to the point where your, you know, whatever new industry emerges on Ethereum can't scale, where do you go? But Ethereum is, will always be the leader, I think, in, in, in terms of the, the, this, the network of people testing out new things. It's a, I call it, it's a great test bed. I don't think it gets to scale uh, for low transaction fee um, products anytime soon. Maybe with roll-ups, but I, I'm still skeptical that happens anytime soon. Uh, and I think by then Solana, I, like my, my prediction is Solana is easily going to be one of the top, uh, you know, probably 
I, I would say number two or three by the end of this year in terms of um, smart contracting platforms and, and with scale. Like you know, it'll be Ethereum, Solana, and someone else. I'm guessing, and and that's that's just me being optimistic. <laughs> It also means it's, you all, it's all to the hard work of like the folks building on top of it. <laughs> you know, it's also it's the community. I think the community, the community in Solana is fantastic. Uh, it's a great community, and everyone look, look. Solana attracts people who 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 see the importance of something like fifty thousand transactions per second. How important that is. That's a key key thing for Solana, um, and and you'll find that people who go to the Solana community want scale. So if you want scale, Solana is the place I think where you just gravitate towards, and then you find other like-minded people who all agree that this is this is how it plays out at scale. But you know, I'm not ragging on any of the other communities out there. And I think Ethereum is great for what for, for lots of different things, but we go we're going to Solana because we want to scale and we think it gives the best chance. So I want to thank everyone who's come and joined us for the past hour. Uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, thanks for participating. Thanks for helping the Waitroom team test out Waitroom. Um, and uh, and any any final thoughts, Anatoly? Um, awesome to have you guys uh, to run and deploy in Solana. That's really cool. Uh, I think like the possibility of the kind of new new com new composed markets that we can do with identity and with like very large token user bases, I think are really interesting. So. I think like the next like you know iteration of social networking uh, marketplaces are going to happen you know in large part thanks to you guys. I hope so. Well, thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Always good seeing you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Have guys. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.